Hey, everybody, welcome to this week's Home Experience Talk. Man, I, uh, <laughs> I'm in another new place. I'm in Winter Haven, Florida, and um, I've never been in this place. I shared last week, I recorded kind of how I go about being led by the Spirit, even in where I'm going to record. And the same thing happened today. I was spending some time meditating on the Word, asking God, how do I... God, what do you want me to share? What's some things that you're stirring in my heart that I can share with the people of the difference? And I, I left that coffee shop as I was meditating on the word. I said, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm just going to drive and just going to show me. And I, I pulled my car into this parking lot. I went into this building. I got into the elevator. I went to the second floor and here I am. I, I feel like I'm in like a war room back in the 80s. It's a it's got this big map. Anyways, it's a perfect spot for me to just share some things on my heart. I want to dive into some scripture and I'll continue to inspire you to allow your life to reflect light, to be the light of the world. And so last week, uh, we talked a lot about how God, his foundation, right, in, in Psalm uh, chapter 97, verse 2, it says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. We talked about as, as we are created in the likeness of God, in the image of God, then righteousness and justice are hardwired into our DNA. And we talked about how the Bible talks about giving justice to the weak and the fatherless. Man, fatherless is mentioned several times. And for, for you men that are watching this out there, man, I hope you would ask the Lord to give you a father's heart to love people uh, as, as only a father can do. It's a special role for us as father figures in this world. It, it, it talked about creating or correcting oppression and, and pleading the widow's cause. But what does it look like for us to do that? Like, what is our role in bringing kingdom justice into the world? If you participated in our home experience last week somewhere with a group of people, you talked about one of the questions we had is the difference be between going out and doing works in order to earn yourself a position in God's kingdom, trying to earn your salvation, or as it says in Ephesians, being created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And, and we said, man, what a difference it is instead of this performance Christianity that says, man, you got to check all these things off the box. You got to do all these things to prove that you're a Christian. Instead, it's coming from a place of receiving from, from Christ receiving your assignments and then going out and fulfilling the things he created for you to do long ago. It was pretty cool. We had a, a, a home experience in Winter Haven uh, last week and we had another family, but then uh, my boys were with us and they invited a bunch of friends and we had some really, really amazing discussions about how religion, and if you line up different religions around the world, they're really all based on what it is that we can do in order to try and get into the good graces of God. Instead of focusing on what God has already done, God's plan versus our plan. And we talked about serving people out of a place of humility and love instead of a place of trying to earn something. You, you, you end up with burnout in that in that situation. So there's this story in Luke chapter 10 that I want to really focus on because we're not exactly sure the setting that Jesus is in, but most likely he's teaching somewhere. And there were oftentimes these teachers of the law. They're basically like religious lawyers, right? They know the ways, the law, and, and they were they were lording that over people. And they were teaching them all these things that they had to do. Again, religion versus relationship. And let's pick it up in Luke chapter 10, verse 25. It says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Okay, isn't that something we all want? We want to know that we're going to survive beyond our short life here on this earth. What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? 
He answered, going all the way back to Deuteronomy, which we talked about last week. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Okay. I talk all the time about Jesus' reply to the religious leaders when they ask, what's the greatest commandment? And he basically says the very same thing. And he makes it very simple for us to understand what do we have to do to be in right relationship with God. So what happens in the story? This religious lawyer, right? It says, but he wanted to justify himself. Justice, there's justice. He wanted, to, he wanted to make sure, he wanted to justify his actions because he was one of those people that felt like, I'm doing it all right. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, let's pause for a second because he made three bad assumptions by asking Jesus this question. He, he obviously knew what Jesus meant, and Jesus would have been teaching all these things about love and grace and mercy, but he, but he wanted to justify himself, so three things he did wrong. Number one, he, he sort of assumed that he had already obeyed the first commandment, right? Because he doesn't ask any questions about that, like, hey, how do I make sure that I'm loving God with all my heart, all my mind, all my soul, all my strength? Right? He goes right to, well, hold on, who is my neighbor? So he assumed that he had already done that. And, and again, I want to address this real quick because sometimes people don't understand what does that look like? Like, how do I love God back? Well, I want you to think about it in your own life. How do you show love to a friend? How do you show love to a spouse? How do you show love to someone else? Well, it's very simple. First and foremost, you have to give them your attention, right? You have to pause and divert your attention from distractions and give your attention to that person. You have to spend time with them and then you have to engage them. You have to listen, you have to share, you have to serve them, you have to um, help them through situations to care for them, right? It's pretty simple. Well, this is the same with God. We've got to divert our attention from distractions and we've got to divert our attention to God. So that's how you, that's how you receive and show love back to God. So the first assumption he made is that he's already doing that because he's following the law. The second assumption he made and this is incredible to think that this teacher of the law thought that he could love God deeply with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength, and yet not love his neighbor as himself. Because he, he didn't really, you know, the, the law was being taught in those times that you are supposed to hate your enemy. And it didn't really talk you know, about having to love your enemy. And, and so he's like, well, I, I can love my, my neighbor. And what he thought that meant is that people that love you, right? People that are your friends. But Jesus is going to get to the point of like, well, that's easy, right? Like, what good is it for you to just love the people that love you? Isn't it much harder to love people that are difficult to love, that don't love you back? But he made this assumption uh, that uh, that he could love God and not love his fellow man. And then, and then finally... Uh, he's trying to narrowly define who his neighbor is, right? Because he wants to make sure that he's going to get in. And so uh, that's what he does. Uh, I want to I wanna continue on in the story uh, and, and let's find out what Jesus does. So Jesus takes a parable in order to teach him a lesson. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. That would mean, you know, leaving him half dead. Like, unless he gets attended to, he's probably going to die. So it's a pretty dire situation. Now, a priest happened to be going down the same road. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Now, this is a priest. This is someone who's supposed to know God. This is someone who has dedicated their life to following God. Think about what Jesus is saying here to these people. 
So too, a Levite, now a Levite would have been somebody from the order of priests who would have sworn an oath to the law. And again, a very devout follower of God, a religious person. So, uh, so too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. So now he's already categorizing this religious teacher of the law into like, hey, I'm showing you it's, it's not about what you think. You're missing the heart of everything. So then he says, but a Samaritan. Now, you have to understand that the Jewish people despised Samaritans. They were like the scum of the earth is what they felt like. And so Jesus is going to use what they thought was the scum of the earth to make a point about what's truly important about following God. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Interesting. This man not only gives of his time, he shows pity and empathy and compassion, but he follows through on caring for this man and he even gets him a place to stay. And then he's generous with what he's been given and he shares that with someone else. And he doesn't just leave him there like, hey, I'll pay for one night. He says, look, I will take care of the bill. Do what is necessary to make sure he is okay. Then Jesus says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now, I want to make a point here because what Jesus is showing us is everything that's in the heart is what's going to drive you in your action. That's why we talk all the time about your, your relationship with God, the purity, the amount of time that you spend allowing yourself to receive love from God is going to make a difference in your actions. So you have to make sure you're reserving that space, reserving that time. And for me, throughout the day, I'm having to like divert my attention from what I'm doing back to the Lord and say, Lord, help me not miss you in these situations. Now, Jesus, he always focused on personal responsibility. And what he was showing is as the church, those that say they're closest to God, they should be the ones in leading the way. And how? what is the fruit from that? Well, it's loving your neighbor. And Jesus is showing like even the Samaritan that you despise is doing a better job than you because you're not loving others. You think your neighbor is just the people that treat you well and give you a place of honor at the table. But no, you're supposed to sacrifice. You're supposed to take up your cross and serve the least of these, those that cannot speak up for themselves. Well, that brings me to this concept of social justice that we hear about now uh, in our society. And I kind of wanted to just address, address it a little bit because I get asked, I'm like, they're like, Greg, how come people who have zero faith in God, they don't even believe in God, they have no Jesus, they're creating these social justice organizations that are supposedly caring for the least of these, and yet I don't see even the church doing some of these things. Like, how can that be? Well, I wanna, I wanna explain that to you because I said we are hardwired to, to have love and to have mercy and to have justice, right? Those are things, like everybody is, is bothered by injustices. It's why the news continually throws out injustices and justices because they know it's gonna hit something deep within your in your heart. Well, Satan knows this as well and Satan perverts things. Satan takes things that God intended for good and just shifts it a little bit in order to pervert it and use it for selfish purposes. I'm reminded of Paul who's traveling to meet this uh, leader, this proconsul guy. And in Luke chapter 13, verses 9 and 10, it says, Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, being spirit-led, 
looked intently at this guy who was influencing this leader. His name was Bar Jesus, meaning son of Jesus, and he was professing to know Jesus. He looked intently at him and said, O oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? See, people will often take this good thing that God put in us, but they will pervert it and they will use it for their own purposes. This is why it's so important that we understand the Bible as the operator's handbook, right? The Bible is God's written word in order to instruct us on the ways of the Lord. It is a guidebook so that we can now think about this, how beautiful this is. You can take the guidebook and you can also have a living guide in the Holy Spirit walking with you. You put the two together and man, you're going to be on fire for Jesus. You're going to know exactly what to do. This is why Jesus says in Luke 12, 12, when you're called before rulers and authorities and principalities, don't worry about what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will speak for you. So what about all this social justice, all these causes that are happening? Well, I wanna just share with you kind of how we got there. Back in the 1930s, Franklin D. Roosevelt uh, gave a speech. And in that speech, he outlined two different ways of governing or sort of like societal, societal philosophies. And one was to just sort of let the natural order of things sort of work themselves out. It's kind of our survival of the fittest philosophy. Well. He argued that that's not a very good um, way to live life because people will, the marginalized will never get ahead. And so he proposed this idea and he used the word social justice. And in the, in the speech, he said uh, that he believes in social justice through social action. Now, over the years, the definition of social justice has become promoting a just society by challenging injustice and valuing diversity. Now, this is where we get to the point of where we are now, because now it becomes, when you don't have God in the center of it, and you don't have a, a right way, I talked about it last week, that God is the creator and he created things with purpose, and we believe that there are moral goods and moral bads, right? We believe there are right and wrong ways. Well, when you don't believe that, then what happens? Then we make up our own rules and so when it comes to this justice thing, we, we decide who is marginalized and who is not marginalized. We make up our own rule and then the game becomes equality of outcome and not equality of opportunity. Let's face it, right? Even as followers of Christ, if he calls us to an assignment, we can't sit in our in our house all day and watch game shows and soap operas, we've got to go out and execute the strategy. We've got to go out and do the work, right? We are the hands and feet of Christ. And so equality of opportunity, yes, but equality of outcome, no. What happens is you get people in power that start to make the decisions and they make the rules on who is marginalized and, and who we need to pay attention to and they use it for their own personal gain. This is how we get, and this is incredible, uh, We. this is how we get men that are being recognized in national publications as woman of the year. See, the result becomes a self-serving result and, and organizations capitalize on these on these things, they capitalize on the lives of other people or the or the misfortunes of other people and they raise millions of dollars, but yet they really don't help the people that they say they are serving. The reason why this is, is because we live in the last days and in 2 Timothy chapters three in verses four and five, it talks about that people will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. See, people that, that have these social justice, like, ah, but they're doing it without God, it looks like godliness. And so we're like, ooh, that's good. I want to do that. 
but yet it's denying any power from God himself. And if you're doing it for yourself, then you're not really doing it to serve the kingdom of God. This is why you have to have the right heart. And Jesus was constantly emphasizing the importance of personal relationship and personal responsibility. As the church, this is our call. And I would say to you, if you're not actively asking God and seeking God for those justice things that he wants you to pay attention to, which by the way, I have found always seem to manifest themselves in an individual, someone that is close to me or someone that is sort of in my sphere of influence. There are so many people that come up against me in a, in a, on a daily basis and God's like, nope, nope, nope. But then boom, all of a sudden he'll make it clear, hey, this is somebody that I want you to show some mercy and some kindness to. The solution to our issue is not this moral relativism where it's like, hey, we just decide what we're going to do. The solution is that we have to seek the justice of God and, and we're going to see tons of injustices out there. We can't worry about all those things. We have to focus on the individual and as a church, if we do that, and then think about this, the movement starts with one person caring for one person, then two ca people caring for two people, then three people caring for three, and then teaching those other three to do the same. It expands really, really quick, which is why Jesus used that model for himself. I want you to have some opportunities to talk a little bit about this in your groups and talk about maybe uh, how God is leading you to care for others, how, how God is asking you to show this compassion to other people. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity we have uh, to, to really listen and receive from you. We want you to transform our hearts. Give us that, that deep compassion, that deep empathy to, to not only care for one another in our groups, but to care for those that you're going to bring into our path. Help us to make ourselves aware of that and then uh, go forward and, and make a difference, make an impact for your kingdom. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, I hope to see you on June 10th. That's Saturday at Northdale Park. We're going to have a little picnic. I'm going to have a pretty epic water balloon fight and uh, some hula hoop games. We're going to have an epic family kickball game. Uh, bring your picnic and your chairs or some shaded trees out there. We're going to have a great time. Uh, I hope to see you there.